Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this Pegasus webinar about connecting Hyperledger Base U to enterprise systems. Uh, today, we'll be talking about Hyperledger Base U's new plugins API. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Tim Bako. I'm a product manager here at Pegasus. I've been here about uh, a year, year and a half, uh, working on Hyperledger Base U. And I'll be presenting alongside Dan O'Farron from our team. My name is Dan O'Farron. Um, I've been at Consensus for about a year and a half. I've been a blockchain protocol engineer at Pegasus the whole time, working on Basu. Um, so yeah, uh, give you a quick idea of what we'll be going over today. Uh, we'll, first, we'll first start with a, a brief overview of what Pegasus is, what we work on, um, and then we'll dive right into the plugins API. Uh, we'll kind of walk through what Hyperledger BaseU is, how it works, uh, what the plugin API has added in terms of functionality, um, and a quick case study of Pegasus Plus, which is a product that the Pegasus team has built over top Hyperledger BaseU using the plugin API. Once that's done, uh, Daniel will take you on a deeper dive of the API itself, first giving you just a technical overview uh, with regards to how it works, uh, how you can get it started, write your own plugin, and then we'll demo sort of a sample plugin um, that we've built for this webinar. We'll have some, some time for Q&A at the end, but there's also many spots throughout the, the presentation that we'll stop to make sure that, that everything is clear and to answer questions there. And at, as the final item, uh, we have a couple of potential next steps, depending on what you're all interested in. And a few friendly reminders just before we get started. Uh, please mute um, so that other people don't hear you as, uh, as, as we're talking. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat box directly. Uh, Grace and a couple more people from Pegasus will be monitoring, uh, so they'll either answer them directly or let you know when we have sort of the next spot for, for questions. Um, and uh, yeah, we're recording this. We'll send you a copy of the slides uh, at, at the end so you, you can have all the materials. And we'll try and paste the links in the chat as we go. So if you want to follow along, uh, you can do that. So. Um, diving into it, what is Pegasus? Uh, so Pegasus is part of Consensus. We're the protocol engineering team there. And we basically work on everything related to the Ethereum protocol. So this includes the Ethereum mainnet today, research on Ethereum 2.0, as well as permission networks. And we both build products uh, like Hyperledger BaseU and uh, do some R&D to, to make sure that mainnet is enterprise grade. So over the long term, we kind of think that uh, there will be a convergence that you'll see more and more enterprises using mainnet and Ethereum 2.0 directly, uh, but we're very mindful of the fact that there's a lot of barriers to entry for enterprises doing that today. So we build a lot of the tooling required for enterprises that want to use Ethereum that maybe uh, aren't, aren't ready to use mainnet today. Um, and so we're really the only team in the space that's building everything. So the full spectrum from enterprise Ethereum uh, to mainnet all the way to Ethereum 2.0. And so Hyperledger BaseU is our kind of flagship product. It's an Ethereum client that works for both public and private networks. Um, we launched it about two years ago, and it has really, uh, you know, everything you'd expect from, a, from an Ethereum client. Um, and most, more recently, as you can see on the slide, we've added the plugin API to it. This plugin API basically allows users to take data from a BaseU network and feed it directly in the rest of their application. So whether this is a permission network that you're running or a network like mainnet or one of the test nets, you can use it to build a plugin that will interact with the data in the client directly, um, meaning you don't have to constantly pull the data out of your client. And some of the data that's exposed by the API today is everything related to blocks, so the block data, uh, as well as their execution results, so what happens once the block is processed, everything related to both smart contracts, their execution, the code, and, and the logs, uh, things related to the syncing state of your client as it's joining the network, the balances of the accounts and the contract on your network, and finally, everything related to transactions, so whether it's the transactions themselves uh, and, and their execution on the chain or the transaction pool. So when, when transactions are added and removed from the pool. 
And this is all, so this is all the data you can have access to via the, the plugin API today. And so why, there's a couple of reasons why we decided to build this. Uh, and, and the first one is really because it gives you kind of in process access to the data. Uh, so that means you can have direct Java calls to your data. Um, and this is very useful if you're doing many of those of those calls, right? Because you don't have to deal with the networking overhead. You don't have to worry about having your reliable connection to the client because your plugin is really sort of part of the Java executable. And, and the way to think about it is that if you're going to be constantly polling the, the client, uh, maybe a plugin is a good architecture for you to build your service. Another, another reason why the, the plugin API made a lot of sense is that it gives you access to internal client data that's not necessarily exposed uh, through the, the regular APIs like JSON RPC, WebSockets, or even GraphQL. Um, and a couple examples of that are things like the block propagation, the consensus state within IBFT, uh, and like we've mentioned before, the additions and removal to the transaction pool. So there's no JSON RPC call for any of those things, but you can build a plugin that that leverages that data and, and acts on it. And, and finally, uh, one of the reasons we've built a plugin API as part of our longer term roadmap is that over time, it enables you to swap some supporting services out of Besu for other ones. Um, so as the data that's, that's kind of fed to those services is exposed via the API, you can basically change what that, services, what that service is. Um, and one example of this is uh, for Pegasus Plus, we've added encryption at rest support to base use database. Uh, and this was done again through our plugin API. And, and it's kind of an example of, of, of one full service we were able to swap out. Um, and you should expect more and more services that uh, in base to become swappable uh, in the future as we, we develop this API more. And finally, uh, yeah, so Pegasus Plus, we mentioned this before, it's basically a, a distribution of Hyperledger BaseU that we've built uh, where we bundle some additional plugins that, uh, that again, interact through the plugin API uh, that solves some, some problems that enterprises have when they're deploying this technology. So the, the three uh, main plugins that are there today are the database in inscriptions that we've already mentioned. We've added some advanced validator nodes monitoring so that uh, if you're running an IBFT network, you can get much more granular, granular data about the health of your validator nodes. And finally, uh, we've added the ability to uh, use Kafka and Kinesis for event streaming. So any data that's exposed by the plugin API, you can stream directly to Kafka or Kinesis um, and, and have that interact with the rest of your application. And so it's kind of an example of some functionality our team was able to build over top Hyperledger BaseU by using this API. So I'll pause here uh, for questions. So Tim, jumping back, it looks like we have um, a question about why pe um, a plugin API. So uh, the question is, why would you want services to be swappable? Uh, why wouldn't you just want them all to be fixed? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. I think there's, there's two main reasons for that. Uh, the first is that basically every service that you end up using as part of your, your stack has some trade-offs, right? Um, and some database might be more optimized for some types of queries and others for another type. Um, and as, you know, enterprises deploying their own networks have more and more like niche or unique use cases, um, it allows them to swap, you know, a service for something else that's just more suited for, for their environment. Um, and so, you know, what we have coming kind of as a default with BaseU is what we believe to be like the, you know, the best default for an Ethereum client. Uh, but there's definitely cases where, where that's just not uh, appropriate for the, for the environment. And one example is uh, this encryption at rest that we've added uh, to BaseU as part of Pegasus Plus. We had some customers who had that as a specific use case. And the reason it's not a default uh, on all of BaseU is it affects performance. Right? So unless you have this strong uh, use case for encryption, then you probably don't want to take that performance hit uh, accessing your database. Um, and I guess the second reason why you'd, you'd want services to be swappable is uh, if you already have a very uh, large existing technology stack and you don't want to add a new service there. So if there's something that can be swapped in BaseU for a service that you already use as part of your enterprise, then you're not kind of adding a new dependency uh, in your stack. Uh, so just to have everything be more uniform uh, is another reason why you would do that. Great. 
Uh, next question we have is, what is the maximum TPS in BASU? Is it capable of uh, gamified like transactional processes? Can BASU handle millions of transactions per day, basically, uh, is the question. So I'm not sure what's meant by the middle part of that, the gamified like transaction processes. I don't know, Simon, do you want to just clarify that? Simon. He's muted. Oh, so one of the questions I think, happening. yeah, for millions of transactions a day, to get a million transactions a day, you only need 12 transactions per second. Um, and oh. Ethereum mainnet handles up to about 35 and we handle that. Internally, we've had, um, we can support millions of transactions based on our internal benchmarks. Um, we don't have anything that's been, you know, certified and professionally um, released yet, but we can handle millions of transactions per day on an Ethereum blockchain. In terms of the maximum TPS, I think it's in the couple hundreds. It, it always depends on what types of transactions you're looking at, because obviously like raw ether transactions are kind of the simplest to execute and that'll get you the highest TPS. Uh, but in a lot of permission network use cases, what people want are actually smart contract calls. And then it becomes kind of dependent on the, the amount of gas each of those calls uses. Um, but in the, in the hundreds is probably like the right order of magnitude. Uh, does that answer your question, Simon? And uh, sorry, and hundreds Tim, per second. In, and in a permission network setting, not public. Yes, obviously on mainnet, I, obviously, but change just, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I guess you would get uh, hundreds per second would get you in the like low millions, you know, uh, per per day. Uh, but you only need to sustain that. 12 per seconds to hit a million per day. So mainnet's doing that already. Um, Next question. Um, Fair asks, when you mentioned direct Java calls, do you mean a more push model than pull? If the data is gathered from outside the node, which is the benefit really mentioned of Java calls? So yeah, it really is more of a push model than a pull model. Um, you could do both. You could, in theory, have your plugin work on a timer and pull data in. But for like the block propagation that I'm going to show in the demo, we wait for basically to tell you that, hey, we're propagating a block. Here's the data. And so that way that the plugin reacts immediately when base is ready for it, rather than having to have um, some external service pull it through an API. And there's no standard JSON API for block propagation anyway. So that's another advantage. Great. And then one more before we move on. Uh, does Pegasus Plus uh, provide Enclave services like or Orion for private transactions? where large data can be shared and stored in RDBMS or NOSQL? I don't know, the, I know no SQL. Mm -hmm. So I think the question yeah. is about on. Yeah, we do have Orion. Um, I'm sure we had another webinar about Orion. So um, we do support the, those for sure. And I guess today, uh, there is no additional Orion functionality in Pegasus Plus, as, as I understand it. So if you go to the Orion documentation, everything that's there that's part of the open source uh, functionality is, is what we have. Um, we do have some plans for, for some Pegasus Plus functionality on Orion in the future. But uh, yeah, everything today with Orion is, is fully open source. Great. Looks like y'all are in the clear. You can keep it going. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it off to Dano to walk us through the, the technical overview of the plugins API. Yep. So this will be the technical bit. We're going to go over some some of the lower level details of how you might do a plugin and some of the stuff that you will um, get from plugins. So the first question though is how do you build and deploy a plugin? Um, it's pretty simple. It's just a simple Java program that is in a jar. Uh, you expose a service from the jar via the Java plugin module system um, service APIs. There's a couple of ways to do that. So when you write your jar and you expose your service through the jar via the Java services API, um, Basu will then look into a specific directory. Right now it's uh, Basu underscore home, wherever your Basu home is, slash plugins. Uh, Basu is going to look at all of the jars there, and it's going to look for all of the uh, Basu plugin services from there, and it's going to load all of those. Um, so you can put multiple plugins into a single instance of Basu. 
Um, another thing worth pointing out is it's uh, going to need to be a fat jar. So if there is a library that Basu does not already have installed, like if you're accessing uh, PostgreSQL or some other external database, you need to integrate it in as a fat jar. Uh, that's something that uh, you know Maven and Gradle and modern Java build systems know how to handle. I think the keyword is fat jar there. Um, so here's a quick overview of the life cycle of what a plugin goes through. The top line is Basu itself. Um, the middle line is a little bit of the Java system that doesn't plug in the plug. So Basu handles six startup tasks before it even talks to any plugins, not many. Um, but then it goes quickly and asks the Java module services loader to say, hey, what are the plugins that I'm going to be looking at during my life cycle? And it returns it to them and it gets it either from the uh, module info files, oops, <laughs> gets it either from the module info files or it gets it from headers in the manifest and returns those to Basu. And then when Basu gets these plugins, it has uh, two, uh, three major lifecycle sections that it goes through. First, it creates the plugin, calls the noargs constructor. Um, the first major lifecycle step is the registration. And you'll know that this happens before Basu does its full startup. It's happening really early. So each plugin is registered. Uh, Basu provides a context to the plugin that it needs to remember if it wants to talk to in the, in the future. Most plugins will stop there. But if a plugin wants to expose any CLI options or expose with anything that needs to be registered for the CLI, it's going to need to talk to Basu via the uh, Pico CLI options service and say, hey, here's my CLI options, or hey, here's some stuff that you need to know before you run CLI parsing. So after plugin registration, we do the full startup. We take the CLI arguments, we parse all of them, including the new CLIs from any of the plugins that you have, and then we do everything um, right up to the point where we would start connecting to the network. So all the things about the blockchain is loaded, all the database is validated, all sorts of other things are started up. And just before we start talking to the network, we ask each plugin to start. So each plugin gets a start message. And then the plugin does whatever it needs to do to make sure that it's ready to run when Basu is running. So that all the other services that Basu has that the plugin might need will be set up and running. Um, typically, you'll do things like register for events you're going to listen to, um, if you're going to expose any other things. Right now, we don't have um, uh, anything exposed with, with JSON RPC services. But if you were to do that, that is where you would do that in that execution. And once you register everything with your Basu services, um, with Basu, then Basu goes into full network startup. It starts connecting to the network and starts doing everything that you would set, expect a regular old blockchain client to do. It's going to ask for peers. It's going to get events. It's going to get blocks. It's going to publish blocks. It's going to get new transactions. It's going to mine those. It's going to send those out. Now, during this normal execution, your plugin might get events that are registered for it. If it registered to listen to, say, hey, Basu, tell me when you're going to propagate a block. We're going to send you that message during the normal execution. Um, and those are all opt-in for each of the plugins. Plugins don't get those messages unless they tell Basu, I want to hear those. Now, this normal execution could go on indefinitely. But typically, a node is going to go through an orderly shutdown if you're going to upgrade the system, if you need to turn the CPU off, or whatever else. So when Basu begins an orderly shutdown, um, like you press Control-C in the prompt, or you send the, 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 the shutdown message uh, via your, your OS, it's going to start shutting down all of Basu, and then it's going to shut down all the plugins. Now, this isn't the plugins where you would do things like unregister from any events that you've listened to, or you might need to do cleanup tasks if there's anything that you need to do in any of your remote data systems that you've activated. Um, so after all those services are given a shutdown message, um, then Basu shuts down in the normal fashion. So three major life cycles, register before anything, then start, and then stop. Any technical questions before I dive into the demo? There we go, we got one. Uh, Eric asks, can you add or update plugins while Basu is running? Um, that's not in the API right now. We do have an API we can tell a plugin to reload, which will take it through its re through the register and start lifecycle. Register won't have too much of an impact because the CLI will already be there. But we do have an API where you can tell a plugin to reload. Um, if that's a feature you would like, uh, please post something to the Basu Jira. Um, because that's the sort of thing where we would want to know what the community needs as far as reloading. Because as an engineer, I could write something awesomely complex that doesn't do anything near what people in the real world want it to do. So 
feel free to log a bug and tell us what it is you need about it if you think that's a feature that you need. Next question, what is the security model around the plugins? So the security model around the plugins is that we expect the plugins are as trusted as the node. Um, because in order to install a plugin, you're going to have to have access to the software that's running it. And it's expected that you're going to have the source code for the plugin yourself. So right now, we don't put any barriers between the sorts of data it can access other than the API. We don't do any isolation. We don't do any user level isolation. If you need more advanced user isolation like that, um, probably the JSON RPC APIs are what you would want because that's the sort of thing that you could put behind a proxy that could manage all of your security concerns. Um, if there's something that the existing Ethereum APIs don't expose, you could use a plugin to create such an API and then put it behind your secure infrastructure. Looks like that's our last question for now, so we can hop over to the demo. Oh, all right. Sorry, just so, one more question that just popped up. Yeah, from Simon, any particular use cases that Basu is directed to were in healthcare? Any reason why Basu should not fit? Any overall, I guess, description of Basu's target users would be helpful. Um, I can I can take that. Uh, so for Basu, we really try to target enterprises in the broadest possible sense. And I think what we the way we think about that is is organizations that need like enterprise level reliability from their client. Uh, so yes, we've had conversations with healthcare uh, users before, um, and, and that's the sort of, of use case space you would, uh, would would be well suited for. Um, and, and if you need things such as uh, private transactions and whatnot, then Pegasus has other kind of sister products that base you, which which can help provide that functionality. Um, and and you know stuff that we're mindful about at, at base you is just how we do versioning and making sure we don't break sort of the, the previous version of base you're using if you're already running a network, uh, high availability, having really up-to-date documentation, offering uh, sort of premium support if that's the type of stuff you need. Um, so yeah, uh, healthcare is, is one of the, the markets we've definitely talked with. Uh, we're B2C building a tokenized membership of consumers at scale, does that fit? I think it would, but I think obviously it would be better for probably us to have a, a side conversation on this. Um, but I guess at a high level reading this, there's nothing that that scares me. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be a fit. Um, All right. So if we're gonna go oh, to how demo, do we can I... contact you directly. Um, on the last slide of this, there will be an email and also we'll be sending you uh, like all the materials for this webinar. Um, and you can just reply to the webinar email and, and that'll, that'll contact, that'll reach out to us. And I'm pretty sure my email and Dano's is also at the end of the webinar. So there should be plenty of ways to, to contact us. Okay, if I could get the screen for the demo. Yep. Uh, let's tap one. Sure. All right. Oh, I don't, I'm doing this out of order. Stop sharing. I need the slides. There's two slides that come up before this. We practice this and of course I get something wrong. <laughs> so first we have a couple of overview slides about what the demo is going to be. Um, where we talk about, uh, Tim, can you share it? The slides? Yes. Sorry, I went Sorry. too early on the screen request. Oh. oh, my God. Okay, this is the right one, right? Yep. Yeah, this is the right one. So this demo is available on GitHub. Um, the link is at the end of it. It's Pegasus Edge slash uh, plugins API demo. Um, and this demo is just a really short one designed really to focus on showing the registration and lifecycle. It doesn't do anything terribly exciting. Um, in this case, we're going to do some calculations on the gas usage of blocks as they're propagated and expose them via Prometheus. The reason we chose Prometheus is because we have a, a service within Basu already that exposes it like it's an enterprise system. So the first, we use four different services in this. The first one we're going to use is the Pico CLI options. And that's mostly to demonstrate how you would integrate command line arguments into your plugin. Not really necessary for the plugin, but this is what we do for demos. The second two services are the metric category registry and the metric system. These two pairs of plugins 
work together. One, the category registry is needed. So we can, before the CLI comes up, register and say, hey, we have a new category of metrics that we want to expose through, through uh, our metric system. And the other one is where we get the actual counters and the actual gauges that we put the data into um, for the Prometheus metric endpoint that we have as part of Basu. The final service we're using is Basu events. We put some events in there. Um, some of them are the type you can get from web services, from uh, WebSockets. We also have a couple in there that you can't get from WebSockets um, when we propagate a block and when uh, transactions enter and leave our memory pool. There's no standard memory pool APIs. There's no standard event when a block is propagated except for the peer-to-peer -peer via the JSON RPC type events. So to go through the life cycle of the plugin, we're gonna do the three life cycle bits. We're gonna register um, the plugin and do the Pico CLI options and metrics category work. We're gonna start with the metric system in the BASU events, and then we're gonna stop the BASU events. So is the next slide where I actually need the screen? Yes, it is. So here's the link to the GitHub. Um, that's live and open. So let me go ahead and for real this time I wanna share. All right, so here we are at the page. Again, here's another brief description of what it is. Um, a lot of this is just the sort of Java build stuff that you need to get a project up and running. The demo itself is actually just one file in this gas spending metrics. And uh, let me do my IDE because I can make the fonts much bigger and get prettier colors. So the first thing when you write a plugin, a basic plugin, is you need to make sure that it's registered with as a Java service. Um, you can do the Java 9 method with the module info.java. But in this case, I'm using a, a library provided by the Google Guava libraries called Auto Service. You just put this annotation at the front of your plugin. Make sure that it's in your annotation processor when you run the Java C compiler. And it's going to put the necessary fields in the meta inf of the jar that you're building. Works like magic. You put it in, set it, and forget it. It's kind of awesome. Um, there's a couple of, there's one get name field that is used right now. This is just used for user visible values. Um, if there's a, anything where we need to enumerate and talk about it, this returns the name. And then we also need to store the context that we get from the, the registration. So the first lifecycle event we mentioned was the register event. And here we get passed in a basic context. So we just save the context and then we do our two actions for the uh, two services we're using. Um, we use optional in case it's not there. It's some nice modern Java stuff that we're doing there. So we're going to call it create Pico CLI options and register metrics method um, further down in the class when we get those two, when we get the register event, we'll actually get to call those if they can get the services. Um, the next lifecycle event is the start. We do a similar thing. We're going to call start metrics and start events further down in the class file when we get that event. And finally, stop events. When we get the stop event, we're going to call the stop method further down. Now for CLI, we use a very common Java API called Pico CLI to handle our CLI options. And this also does some annotation type processing to create the CLI options and to load it in. So um, what the Pico CLI will inspect for these options, it'll add these to the list of CLI flags and it'll process it for you and it'll put the results in these two fields. It just magically works. It's kind of awesome. I really like it. Gets rid of a lot of complexity. So we just have these two in the basic class. You can put it anywhere. So as part of the registration, we just tell Pico CLI options. This is the name of my plugin. And this is the object where you should look for the annotation. Now the plugin name is kind of important. Here it's going to be uh, gas spending metrics because there's a naming convention that goes on with the CLI options. They have to follow the form of dash dash plugin, dash the namespace that you passed, passed in, dash whatever else you want. So in this case, dash dash plugin, gas spending metrics, name dash dash plugin, gas spinning metrics, prefix. And these are the two default values that if no CLI options are passed in, that it will be used by the plugin. Um, the next step is the metrics category registration. And we need to create a special name of the metrics because we're not going to use one of the existing metrics. We're going to create our own named metric. And in this case, it's going to come up as gas underscore spending underscore plugin. Um, the uh, Java docs will explain what happens with the name namely that goes on here. And finally, for the events, for start event and stop event, we just register a new method on block propagated. Whenever we propagate a block, um, we will uh, call this method on any listener that, that has that using the standard Java events listener patterns. 
and we need to keep a registration of the listener identifier. We keep you know, a log to say which ones we have registered. And to stop the events, um, you just use this registration number that we have and we remove it when we get the stop event so we can stop receiving basic events. Now you can stop the events anytime before the stop event. You can stop listening wherever you want, but in this case, it's gonna be part of the life cycle. The last step is the metrics. Um, we model this off of the way the Prometheus metrics works, where we have our own interface. So in case in the future, we need to provide a new metric service. I know some corporations have their own custom metric services, which is why we decided to go this route. Uh, but in this case, um, we have four counters and four longs representing four gauges for the things that we're, we're gathering. So we're gonna gather what the base cost of the transaction is in each block, just for sending a transaction, you're charged a certain amount of gas. If it's a create contract, you're also charged a little bit. And based on the size of the transaction, we're going to get charged by the data. And finally, all the other gas, I'm going to account to the execution from EVM. And the reason I thought this was interesting is because right now on mainnet, um, there are some larger and larger transactions being posted, and they're mostly revolving around more data being pushed into the transaction. So I was interested in seeing how much data is coming from the size of the transactions and how much is from the execution of the transaction. So if we could take this up to mainnet, we could see those trends long-term. So here we register four counters. Counters are simpler. Gauges are a bit different. We need to register some Java code when the gauge is read. And um, so we get the metrics categories, and the reg registration, and that's all the service stuff. And finally we get to the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to do in this plugin, and that's calculate gas costs. And here we have some Ethereum-based gas cost calculations um, based on the transaction. We do the base and the create. The cost per buy depends if it's zero or non-zero. A lot of black magic you don't need to worry about um, until you do. And so we create, we calculate these values, we store them in the counters, and increase it, and do the block, block, uh, and do the, the aggregate and charge it to the EVM. So the next task would be to actually deploy this. Uh, plugin. So it's pretty simple. First, you do a grade W build. It's going to create the jar. And then we need to make the plugins directory in our Basu installation. So Basu home is where I have my Basu installed. We're going to make that directory. And then we're going to copy it into it. Copy all the jars from build libs into the plugin. Now we're going to run it. First, we're going to run it without any special um, options. This is always the scary part. Yay, it started up. So my node's been down for the plugin, so it's gonna have to uh, catch up before we can get any interesting values. But all of these CLI options are in the readme. All these CLI uh, the tasks that I did and I copy paste to make sure that they work. And then it looks like we have caught up already. So we should be able to go to our exposed metrics page and see that we're exposing demo gas bidding. Now, because I haven't gotten a block yet that has a transaction in it, there's no values in here. Um, now there should be. So we've propagated some with transactions in it. So yeah, so we have a total. Our most recent one was a zero. Um, but here we have the total values and the most recent block propagation values. Um, Gorley's got some serious issues with propagating multiple blocks, but hey, that's blockchain for you. So any moment when we see, there we go. We should see seven here. We can see the gauges storing the values for the most recent ones, and then also publishing the aggregate of all the ones that have been shown. So the next challenge, can I get a couple of random words from the audience? Type in a couple of random things in chat to prove this is a live demo. Random. First random word words. is random. Second is nice background. Nice background. It's bolder. It's uh, actually much snowier right now. This is a static picture. So the prefix will be nice background and the metric name will be random. So as we can see, once it starts up, nice background, random last block base. 
So yep, live, we can get these in and it reflects it in as part of the CLI. And that's the demo. There's a question by Eric. Uh, will we add an open source license to the demo, the repo? Absolutely, I, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I thought we already did, but it should be Apache 2.0 like everything it will, else. It'll be Apache it. 2. I totally forgot. That did not show up in my linting from IntelliJ, so thank you for the notice. <laughs> Any other questions? Or any questions about anything in this webinar? Oh, hi, 157.261. Do you have a question? Oh, on the interoper inter interoperability, interop, yes. So does basically um, support interoperability? There's, I'll field this because there's two kinds of interoperability you might want to talk about. One is between different Ethereum clients. Does it interop with Geth, with Nethermind, with Parity, with Open Ethereum? And the answer to that is yes. On the same chain, we interop with the different clients, fine. So second question, which is often asked, which is interoperability between chains. And that depends on particular interoperability solution you're looking for. Typically those would involve a bridge from like, um, an Ethereum network to like a Fabric network or to a Sawtooth network or an Aroha network. And uh, there's a project, I think a Hyperledger project called Quilt that was looking to investigate that kind of an interoperability. Um, so interoperability is something that we will support. If it supports plain old Ethereum, Basu supports it because Basu is interoperable with all the other Ethereum clients. So if it's an interop solution that works with Ethereum, it works with Basu. And we have another question about what other plugins uh, Pegasus will be doing. Um, so we're actually going to be thinking through that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so if you have any ideas, uh, our Jira or our Rocket Chat, so the, the Basu chat on Rocket Chat is a really good place to put them. Um, one thing that I know Dano had mentioned a couple of times before is an EatStats integration. Uh, so that's probably pretty high up on our list, um, but I don't think we have anything upcoming that's that's announced or set in stone right now. So we're we're very eager to hear what what the community uh, would like to see. But if you have any and, burning ideas, <laughs> yeah, should we go um, to the next slide? Sorry, there was one more question by uh, one fifty seven two six one. Uh, could you please help us on providing documentation about interop? I assume. Um, yes, so uh, we don't have specific interop documentation aside from just the fact that we are uh, mainnet compatible. So that, uh, that means we're compatible with all the other Ethereum clients that work on mainnet. The only thing that is not uh, um, interoperable is when you start to add uh, private transactions on permission networks. So we have Orion, which is our private transaction manager, which is different from uh, Constellation, which is uh, the one that was that was uh, built for Quorum. So when you start customizing your private network, you might lose interoperability. Um, but the closer you are to just like a, a pure or like vanilla Ethereum network, um, then then you should be interoperable. Um, and then there's another question, how does Pegasus work with the EEA and separately on the new token taxonomy initiative? Uh, so we work with the EEA a lot uh, at Pegasus. Uh, so the, the two main, the three main places, sorry, where we, we spend our time are on the EEA spec. So the EEA has a client spec, partially to help enable interoperability uh, with regards to consensus algorithms, private transactions and whatnot. So we spend a bunch of time uh, investing in that. 
The second part where we invest a lot of time is, is uh, the consensus algorithm discussions. So uh, the EEA is working hard in the past couple months to set up uh, a consensus, like a, a new version of IBFT consensus uh, that, that both uh, BaseU, Quorum, and other EEA clients could use. So that, that's one thing we've been spending a lot of, of time. Uh, and finally, uh, we spend a lot of time on their main networking group initiative as well. So that's a bit newer uh, and they're trying to en onboard enterprises onto mainnet. Uh, so that's something where we've also spent time. We haven't spent as much time on the token taxonomy initiative, mostly because we work at kind of a lower level of the stack. Uh, so because we work on basically the core client and the tokens kind of sit on, sit on top of that, there's other teams within consensus uh, that, are, that are more involved than us. Uh, so that's not one where we've invested that much time. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Manny. Um, and then there's one more question. Is there a reason for Apache 2.0 over MIT other than Hyperledger requirements? So there's a couple of things that uh, Apache 2 gets over MIT. MIT is a very short license. Um, and there is some room for interpretation in a couple of those clauses. Apache, of course, has gone through lawyers and they do their lawyer things to make sure that it's gonna stand up in court. But an important addition in the Apache 2 license is they have a patent protection. And um, it, if you don't follow the patent protection a patent retaliation clause, I encourage you to look into that. But what that means is that anybody who licenses anything under Apache 2 and it's covered by one of those patents, you get a license to use what is essential to that patent for that software that's been licensed. And if the company that um, provided that software under Apache 2 then tries to enforce that, then Apache 2 licenses, they're no longer licensed for that. So there's kind of a, a give and a take, you know, there's some game theory going on with why that works or why that won't. Um, I'd encourage you to read up on uh, patent clauses in open source licenses if that interests you. But I think the big thing that Apache 2 has over MIT is the patent protection clauses. It makes it a lot safer for people to use Apache 2 software than MIT because they know that they're not gonna be subject to random had lawsuits by the person who put it out there. And I don't think any of this is covered under patent, but um, everything that they, you know, it's a very standard hyperledger thing that everything out there is under Apache 2 licenses. And, you know, they've got a lot of companies with a lot of patents in the hyperledger group. So, you know, you, you can never tell what's going to be subject to that and what isn't. So, you know, talk to your lawyers. This isn't legal advice. I think even prior to Hyperledger, uh, you know, when Pegasus was started, Apache 2.0 was just chosen uh, because that was kind of favored by enterprises. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was the one that uh, large enterprises were kind of most comfortable with. Uh, yeah, Apache 2 doesn't have the copy left that the GNU series of licenses has. Uh, can we dynamically scale based on the number of input requests? Uh, so do you mean kind of adding your load balancer and, and sharing your requests across across different nodes? Yes, uh, yes, you can. This is not something we do out of the box. Obviously, you'd have to uh, to provide your own load balancer, but we've worked uh, with uh, with customers who are in that that type of environment. Yeah, typically you'd want to do that on the query parts um, where you're going to read stuff and respond to it and pull it out. The core blockchain stuff, all the nodes have to replicate. That's one of the features of blockchain. Um, but as far as, you know, if you want to put up a bunch of uh, JSON RPCs to query stuff, that scales like a fish. Yeah. And I guess, interestingly enough, it also scales alongside different clients. So if you're already running, say, Geth, and you would like to try out BaseU, uh, you can definitely, that's definitely one way you can try it and send, you know, X percent of your traffic through a load balancer to, to base you. Any other questions? Okay, I'll move on. If you have more questions, feel free to, to just post them in the chat. Um, so two final things before, before we end this. Uh, the first is that uh, if you're interested in building your plugin and you'll be attending ETH Denver, uh, the Pegasus team is putting uh, a bounty for the best Hyperledger BaseU plugin built during the hackathon. Uh, so watch out for that. Uh, and basically anything that's a plugin built on BaseU is fair game. So it can be a fun way for you to discover the API if you're attending the hackathon. 
Uh, if, on the other hand, you'd like to know more about the, the plugins that we've already built at Pegasus, uh, whether they're uh, Pegasus Plus or just what we've built uh, with the plugins API in more detail, uh, you, can, you can reach out to us directly over email. I've also posted this email a bit earlier in the chat. Um, and we'll be sending you a survey after the webinar to get some feedback. And there's also a little checkbox on that survey that you can, where you can indicate uh, if you'd like us to reach out to you uh, to discuss any of this further. Um, and um, an eStats plugin is something that's totally achievable within the time frame of East Denver. So if you're looking for an idea, there's one. Yeah. And so, oh, Mary, I've just posted the feedback form in the, in the chat. Uh, yeah, any final questions before we head out? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for watching. <laughs>